I am Jim Collison and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's Called the Coach, recorded on May 1st, 2018. In this special BP10 edition of Call the Coach, it's a resource for Gallup-trained BP10 coaches and educators who want to help others identify and develop their entrepreneurial talents. We have Gallup experts and independent BP10 coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help others maximize their talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you have questions during this live webcast, we'd love to have you join in our chat room. Just look below the main video, the video window down there. Bottom left-hand corner, it says login. Choose that. Choose the guest account. We'll create a new one, but guest. Take out the name and number. Put your name in and hit submit. We'd love to have your questions during the webcast. If you're listening to the recorded version or have questions about custom solutions for small, medium, or large organizations, you can send us an email, coaching at gallup.com, or use the contact form right there on the live page. Don't forget to visit our brand new BP10 site as well, gallup.com slash builder. Again, gallup dot com slash builder. You can also catch the video in both streaming and downloadable audio for offline listening. We call that podcasting. It's available for you off of our coaches blog. Head over to coaching.gallop.com. Don't forget to rate and review. Subscribe to this podcast if you're listening in the Apple Podcast app. Super easy to do that. You can subscribe and hit the notification bell if you're listening on YouTube. And don't forget to hit the uh, the follow button there on Spreaker. Just ways to stay up to date with everything we do. Todd Johnson is our host today. Todd's Gallup's channel leader for entrepreneurship and job creation. And Todd, always great to have you back. Welcome to yeah. session three of four as we talk about Born to Build. We're excited about today. We're excited about each one of these. And uh, again, as I've mentioned in the opening of both uh, the first previous uh, versions, we're just changing the national dialogue. That's kind of our, our project here, our mission. Uh, Born to Build, I'll be solicitous and hold up the book uh, May 8th. Uh, will be sweeping the world and certainly the country and creating those conversations around what have you built? What are you trying to build? What do you want to build? And uh, as we all know, because we're on this call and certainly those that are involved with Gallup know that when you know your talents, uh, good things happen. Building is is better, faster, more impactful, uh, regardless of what we're building. It's uh, certainly applicable to the to the uh, startup community, but very much applicable to existing businesses uh, that want to grow. If, if companies don't want to grow, maybe, uh, maybe this isn't as applicable. I today have the great uh, fortune to introduce a good friend to many, many on this call, certainly a good friend to the U.S. economy and to the future uh, GDP of, of the world. How's that for an introduction? I've never attempted that. <laughs> breathless. Uh, but for, for all those focused on the future of the world GDP, Dr. Sangeeta Bottle is going to take us through a really important uh, activity from the book. Um, it's as, again, applicable to students as it is companies. The first session, of course, we started on knowing thyself and we went through the different activities around your self schema and, and your board of directors and purpose. Last version we, we got to thinking about the idea and storyboarding and, and creating an opportunity journal around the idea. Today, all important activation. If uh, you know an idea without a customer or without activity is uh, not gonna change the world and certainly not gonna change uh, you. So super excited today to go deep. We're only doing the one activity today. Um, obviously our final and fourth will be focused on kind of the team and the scaling of, of the activity and the activation that we're gonna discuss today. Dr. Sangeeta Bottle, uh, thank you very much for leading us. How are you? I'm absolutely fine. And thank you so Great. much, Todd. It's always wonderful to hear the introductions you come up with. I really <laughs> enjoy them. <laughs> I spend hours preparing my introductions, as Marie Monte knows. Yes, I, I can see that. Uh, and I appreciate it. Well, Hello, everyone, and it's wonderful to be back. Uh, last time, as Todd said, we talked about opportunity recognition and how important it is to come up with the right ideas. So this time, we are going to move ahead and actually activate on those ideas. Um, I think action matters much more than words. I'm sure you've heard of uh, uh, phrases like um, ideas are a dime a dozen, uh, which to some extent is true. So unless someone actually takes an idea and does something about it, finds a customer, as Todd loves to say, uh, there isn't really much value in that idea. It is sitting in someone's head or on someone's laptop or a computer and uh, 
uh, not doing much good to the individual, the economy, the country, and the world. So let's talk about um, how the uh, actions will bring together the ideas that were generated in the previous episode of this podcast about around opportunity recognition. And um, people put in work, they bring their talent to the table, put in hard work and build successful products and, and ventures. Um, most of the successful builders begin by developing, uh, and I'm sure you're very familiar with this terminology, minimum, uh, minimal viable product, so MVP. We um, take the MVP to the early adopters, uh, the builders do, I mean, and early adopters are their customers. They learn from the feedback that the customer gives them and that repeat and refine cycle goes on till they really have a scalable business model, a sustainable and scalable business model. So what we will talk about today are the four steps that uh, successful builders take to actually get from the ideation stage to the active action stage or the activation stage. Um, we will uh, begin with um, turning the ideas into hypotheses, and these are nothing but assumptions that the builder makes before he or she launches uh, onto the uh, launches the venture. Um, and in hypothesis building questions, for instance, uh, that the builder looks at are, who are my customers? Um, do they really need what I'm building? And will they pay for it? That's the million dollar question, who will pay for it? Uh, next, they launch experiments. They test those hypotheses and see if they can validate them or reject them. Uh, and then uh, on the basis of the feedback that they get, get from the experiment, they refine the product or the service. They can pivot if the results are not very good uh, and come up with something else. Uh, and then they test again. And that cycle of hypothesizing, experimenting, um, measuring the outcomes, learning from it, and then hypothesizing again is a never-ending cycle. I was just going to say, this isn't a one-time activity. This is recurring, right? Totally. This is totally recurring, and it also is relevant uh, to a startup as well as to an existing business that is looking for new product to launch new products and services. Uh, so it, it, is, it spans this particular uh, step in the builder builder's process spans across different kinds of situations um, that that we can think about in in uh, launching a venture. So I'd even argue, and maybe you know I can't help but interrupt, but <clears throat> and even personalize it to our BP10 journey. We weren't always BP10. We weren't always rank order. For those of us that have been with us for the last four or five years, you'll have seen this process occurring where we let our customers help us refine. <clears throat> and uh, continue to uh, hopefully upgrade uh, our product. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're a 100-year-old polling company. Activating. On many different ideas. Love it. And experimenting and testing every single day. So in the high-tech world, is it... I've heard, and maybe you can validate this or some of our coaches can, a lot of the actual companies are kind of initially built and even sold on wireframes, on yeah. technologies that may not even work or be constructed, but there's so much customer iteration <clears throat> and, and, and funding and things that occur even before somebody throws a switch. Mm -hmm. Is that a thing? That is that happens. Yes, okay. if that's what you're asking. Yes. So their MVPs are uh, sometimes the customer knows it, and sometimes they don't. But uh, they're they're totally built out, refined, and rebuilt before they're uh, actually programmed. Huh. Yes. Uh, ideally, though, you would at every stage uh, of an experiment tested with a customer because yeah. if you don't have a customer you could be building the best Taj Mahal in the whole world you know mm -hmm. uh, and spend tons of resources and time and energy into it but you've never validated it against a customer so yeah. I think that is one thing we will talk about um, specifically today uh, so okay so today what we will discuss is an example of a, uh, it's a real life case study of a builder a highly successful builder, um, and she 
started, she and her husband started from scratch and built a business that they exited. Um, I think according to her book is about $50 million. Uh, so super successful entrepreneur. Uh, her name is Stephanie Breedlove and she um, uh, talks about her entire journey and her experience in her book called All In, How Women Entrepreneurs Can Think Bigger, Build Sustainable Businesses and Change the World. So what she does is she describes uh, how she recognized a need in the market uh, that led her then to launch a business. Stephanie and her husband um, hired their nanny for their young children as both of them were in the workforce and decided that instead of just having a, an informal relationship uh, with the nanny, they would like to turn that into a formal employer-employee relationship. And becoming an employer, of course, then meant that they had to withhold taxes, they had to pay employer taxes, they had to provide health care, paid vacation and sick days, etc. And these are things that neither Stephanie or her husband knew anything about. And um, they figured the process out. And in, in figuring that process out, they realized that, you know, there may be thousands of families out there who are hiring home um assistance or healthcare, uh, um, uh, uh, people who help with healthcare or people who, who help with uh, children, taking care of children like nanny services. And they might also want to have a formal employer-employee relationship, except that they probably don't know how to do it. And so this gave birth to an idea that maybe they could launch something in the market and maybe there is a need there. So they launched Breed Love and Associates, which is now known as Home Pay, and the company helps families pay their in-home caregivers legally, offering payroll, processing, tax advice, etc. So that's the background of the story that we, we are going to discuss today. Now, let's look at the assumptions that this builder, very successful builder, made um, as she started activating on that idea. Um, Jim, if you could please uh, put the... Yeah, it's, it's up, saying you. It's up, okay. Um, so what you see here is this is that uh, the tool that we've created to help the builder keep track of their assumptions, the experiments, the outcomes, and then also dream about the future. So those are the four things that we will talk about today. Um, let's start with Stephanie's hypotheses. Uh, she she had some assumptions when she started uh, the company to help families pay in-home caregivers. And her first hypothesis, as you can read on the screen, is um, relationship-based marketing and sales is the best customer acquisition strategy. Her second was families who hire in-home caregivers want to pay them legally. The third is customers will pay for high-touch service in payroll, tax, and labor law. And the fourth hypothesis is unlimited phone consultation as part of her service will increase customer loyalty and lengthen the customer relationship. So let's see what all she did to uh, validate these hypotheses. So uh, Stephanie started with some basic research into payroll and labor law. Remember, she really didn't have any experience in it. Um, she created a basic website with some marketing materials that she threw in there, defined what she really offered to her customers, which is client education materials and some deliverables. And uh, she also defined the target customer. Who was she actually addressing? Who were the customers that she wanted to solve this problem for? And she outlined the process of delivering her service to her customers. And she did all this on a shoestring budget uh, and while she was employed full time for a consulting company. And the MVP was born. Um, it's a bare bones, no frills product that she was offering to the market, uh, which she had just cobbled together based on everything she had learned about this area, as well as some previous experience she had in terms of being one of those families that had hired a nanny to take care of their children. Um, and the entire exercise is to prove that the idea is viable. So that's what she starts on. Um, and she goes uh, to the next step where she selects her initial customers, that is families who will hire these nannies. And her marketing channel was the placement agencies, the 
the nanny placement agencies that actually send the nanny to the family was the marketing channel because that's how she could reach those families who were looking for care uh, for their children, young children. And um, having identified that target customer base, uh, which is the families who require nannies, uh, she started developing her product to offer them um, advice and uh, resources around payroll and handling uh, sick days and um, health insurance, et cetera. Um, so she uh, launched her experiments. Uh, the first experiment she launched was uh, to educate the placement agencies about their legal obligations to in-home service providers. And um, she um, helped them understand why this is important and why she they can offer this service to their families uh, along with providing nannies, and that would be a value add for the placement agencies, and they would get a cut out of the profit that she's making by selling those uh, services to the to the families. Um, she also offered free phone consulting to families so that they could be brought on board. That was experiment uh, another experiment to uh, help these families bridge that gap between yes, I want to do it, but I don't know how to really do it. So free phone consulting uh, for the families. And she also added, uh, uh, as she built her product, she also added self-service, uh, which was fully automated. Uh, she started offering new products like health insurance and workers' comp. Um, and she eventually moved to offering unlimited phone consultation to families. So um, we, we can see that as she was trying to, um, she, she was looking at four things uh, to understand the customer's problems uh, or the needs in the market. Um, do the customers find the product or service valuable? Uh, are there large number of customers that are interested in my product or my service? And can I make profit with, the, with what my customers are willing to pay? So these are the things that she's trying to um, address or answer these questions as she's running through these experiments. Um, let's look at uh, some of the outcomes of these experiments and, and that will tell us how well she did. Um, so what you see on your, uh, on your screen now is a key component of the activation process, which is how do you measure if it was successful? So if, if you look at uh, the, uh, the very first, uh, Hold on. Let me uh, let me go back a little bit. Uh, when just just to clear up how the experiments um, uh, prove or disprove the hypothesis, um, she contacted the in-home care placement agencies and offered to educate them about their legal obligation. Um, she started with one nanny service uh, or the placement agency and grew it to 125 over the period of two years, which is what tells her that the experiment is successful. Um, the, and the hypothesis is proven at that point. Uh, the, the second hypothesis, which is families who, who hire in-home caregivers want to pay them legally, um, when she offered free phone consulting to the placement um, agency, uh, to the clients of the placement agencies, which is families who hired the caregiver, she grew from 10 families to 100, 2,000, and uh, 10,000, and finally to 100,000 families. And that very rapid growth in her customer base helped her validate the hypothesis number two. And she realized that the experiment that she had run, which was offering them consulting on the phone, was uh, successful in generating that kind of response. Uh, moving on then to with her experiments, um, she, if you can scroll down a little, uh, Jim, She realized uh, that customers will pay for high touch service in payroll tax and labor law uh, as um, the 50% when she when she got I'm sorry when she got on the phone uh, with the families about 50% on the phone sales consultations resulted in a client and customers stayed with the company twice as long compared with other competitors. So the placement firms and families found her product valuable. 
So she had validate, uh, validated her value hypothesis at that point, um, offering that unlimited phone consultation to families. So running these experiments over the time of about two to four years helped her get to these outcomes of exclusive partnership with uh, 100 placement firms, customer base that grew from one family to 10, to 100, to 1,000, to 10,000, and finally 100,000. Um, she had a 50% conversion rate, um, and that led to revenue growth, uh, and 50% conversion rate because of those phone calls and high-touch service that she provided. Uh, and then clients stayed with the company um, twice as long as with other competitors. So those uh, outcomes helped Stephanie figure out that not only were the hypotheses uh, validated, but her experiments were successful. Now, if the results were less than what she had expected in terms of revenue or in terms of conversion rate or customer base, that's the time when uh, exercises like this allow the builder to then go back and say, uh, maybe this isn't working, so I need to test another way of reaching my customer. I need to maybe make changes to my product or service that I offer that could then result into more customer acceptance and higher revenues and more growth. Um, so this exercise of putting down your assumptions, running experiments to prove or disprove the assumptions, having very, very specific metrics, uh, objective metrics that can really um, either validate the, the the concept or the idea or lead to other um, routes will help the the builder understand how well he or she is doing on this path of activation. So if I were, <clears throat> thank you for that. If I were coaching an existing company, one way to maybe bring this exercise to the table would be having them think back about their growth and development thus far, <clears throat> they might not have been conscious about the hypotheses, the experiment, the outcome, but it, it's like all these exercises, it, it is kind of what happens in the game of business or, you know, building something. So yes. being intentional about looking at your history, mm -hmm. which I could do very easily around BP10. Uh, and I dare say I didn't, we didn't follow this model. We maybe should have, but, uh, <clears throat> And that would be a way to kind of validate it and its importance as a way to then go forward. Right. So they could prove out that in their history, be it long or be it short, mm -hmm. that's they've been through this process. Now we want to be more intentional. So as I've said on each call, you know, behavioral economics is just being intentional about what's going to happen anyway. So <clears throat> I uh, think go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think we did follow this process through BP10. So, so for instance, one of our assumptions was in the beginning of our journey that uh, we need to very truthfully and upfront allow an individual to understand the potential that the person has um, in uh, the entrepreneurial field, um, how successful you're going to be. And we need to provide you that understanding from the the reading from the assessment that that we have, the data that we've collected from the individual. And our experiment was launching it among 500 entrepreneur women, entrepreneurs in Mexico, where Gallup consultants were standing on the podium and giving them their reports and then also helping them understand their strengths. Our assumption was that the customer would really appreciate that we are giving them um, information in a very transparent and a direct way and saying that on a scale of one to 10, here is how much your potential is. These are the strengths you need to leverage and this is how you need to grow. Well, that launch of that experiment uh, immediately told us that our hypotheses of, or the assumption we had made that people want to hear what their intensity of talent is or what their actual potential is, um, was not validated. We immediately got feedback from the customers who there were a lot of hurt feelings. And as rare as this talent is, the assessment results were showing that not everyone has the talent of a stellar or exceptional builder. And because those individuals were already in the activity, many of them felt that Gallup was invalidating their choice of career, their choice of life, and was not um, understanding the, the reasons or the passion that they had for 
this activity and for their business. And our consultants immediately got the feedback of those experiments back to you and me, and we made a pivot. So that process that we went through of having an assumption, testing it in the field with an experiment, and it was a controlled experiment of we did it only in one location, we did it only on one project, got the feedback, and we decided we need to pivot. We went from a report that used to show intensity up front. In fact, we had, if you remember, <laughs> a very colorful depiction of I that remember. intensity with a green and a red, which uh, coincided with a stop. Oh, my gosh, you really are at the bottom of the, the scale here. And green, yes, you are on a, on a higher end of the scale in terms of your intensity of talent. And the customer pushed back. And we went to a developmental report, which was much more uh, needed in the market. And I think that was a really good lesson for us because it doesn't matter where the entrepreneur is on that scale. The really exceptional ones, of course, are going to have a much different trajectory of growth and scale. However, there are, as you always say, there are tons of entrepreneurs who are in it for passion. They've taken their hobby to the next level. They are earning a a living. They are supporting it's the backbone their, of the United States of America. Right, they're supporting <clears throat> their yeah, families. That's a good thing, right? And we need to encourage those entrepreneurs, irrespective of where they are on that talent spectrum. And so that was an experiment, um, an outcome, and a pivot that we had okay. made. And there's tons of such experiments we've done over time with BP10. I'm just going to bring a little color to that story because it's a very true story. And you and I were supposed to be there presenting this data in uh, Estado de Mexico. Yeah. We, I got to the airport before you and looked at the board and all the flights were canceled because we had one of the worst hailstorms in our state's history and all the windshields of every airplane at Epley Field was broken. <laughs> so remember, I called yeah. you and we came back to the office at 6 a.m. And we luckily have a great team in Mexico and said, you're on <laughs> because our plane and you wanted to fly down the night before. And I said, no, uh, this is going to be a day trip. So yeah, little piece of our history for when you write your memoirs. Tan Ta Sangita, um, Steve in the chat room asks, you know, this idea of pivoting, wh when do you know? Because I, I think that's a hard part. Like, when do you stick it out and when do you know to pivot and, and what kind of Sangeeta, let's start with you. What kind of advice would you give on how do you know it's time to pivot? You know, it is, um, this is an excellent question and I don't think there is an answer uh, that is, you know, tells you exactly when is the right time to pivot. I think for every venture, for every builder, it would be a, a point that is to be determined by that individual or the team that is working on that product or service. But what I would say is that you have to look at the outcomes. So when you make these assumptions and run these experiments, make sure that you document the outcomes in, a, in as objective a way as you can, because those are the outcomes. If after, say, two cycles of this, hypothesize, experiment, <coughs> measure outcomes, learn from it, and then you repeat that. If those changes that you're making as you're going through this process do not yield you the outcomes that you're looking for, whether it is in terms of revenue, whether it is in terms of growing customer base, whether it is in terms of conversion rate, um, whatever your metrics are specific to your industry and your product and service, that will define at what point it is enough to... Um, have everything, all the information you need to make that decision of what is this working or not? And no one can give you that answer other than your customers. And so that's why we keep harping on how important it is to start getting those customers very early on. And those experiments help you do that because you've got to launch those experiments with your customers. Here's how I'd answer it. I would pivot before you go broke. And I've watched all too many times when you have a, uh, a builder with extreme confidence and determination, mm -hmm. they, they sometimes need the most coaching on when it's time to move on because they're going to prove that the market wants my X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And so I've had some really tough coaching moments over the years with beautifully high talented builders who 
their confidence and determination is going to be the death of the company. And so getting them off those ideas on new ones is really hard. I kind of looked through our exercises that are spread across my desk here and thought, you know, that's also a good time to invoke your board of directors and those that can maybe see things you can't. Um, and, and your customers are a really important part of that because you might think as we did thinking the world wanted their scores. Um, uh, we, we learned quickly that, uh, that wasn't the case, not yeah. even in buckets. Remember we had an interim step where we tried to go from, from the spider graph <clears throat> that we yeah. used in Mexico to the, uh, to the dominant contributing and supporting. And even that was a little bit too much information for the market. Yeah. And, and excellent points, Todd. Uh, I would just add that the principle of affordable loss that we talked about last time wow. in the opportunity journal, uh, those that is a really good one to establish before you even get down to the activation piece. So before a product or a service is is even conceptualized and um, and being built, it is good for the entrepreneur to identify where is that point where the person thinks that this is all I can afford to lose on this, whether it is in, for, in terms of money, time, um, or any other metric. Uh, make sure that that affordable loss is identified up front. And that will then help you match your outcomes to what you um, had said that this is the absolute maximum. Like Sam from our example last time had an affordable loss principle of, I am only going to give one semester to this idea. And if mm -hmm. it does not, do well and if i do not see customers requiring those those recipes that i'm selling to the uh, dining hall uh, services then i'm going to stop and so that gives the person and she said it in terms of time because she had no money yep. uh, but people can set it in terms of resources it can be in terms of time it can be in terms of um, how much am i willing to lose in terms of my income it could be any of these factors but make sure that that affordable loss principle is in the mind of the entrepreneur before uh, this this process or starts. the builder in a company <clears throat> and the executive committee or their board you know anybody right. who has fiduciary or financial interests mm -hmm. in success or failure should probably have uh, shared expectation <clears throat> around uh, growth and viability and time and money yeah uh, you know uh, thank you let me just before you move on let me just say this too in our own example you be ready for your customers when you pivot you've you've gained a bunch of customers who really like your old product mm -hmm. and then you pivot and you move away from that and i i handled many a few of our customers when you guys pivoted who said i really liked those intensity reports what are you doing you're you know you're moving away from what it should be and so as an entrepreneur you also have to realize that pivoting is not it's not cut and dry. It's not always easy. You're going to, you spent all this time acquiring a customer base that if you pivot hard, you're going to move, you might move away from that customer base and you're going to hear from them. And then you're going to doubt yourself. Like, oh, did, I, did I, did I make the right decision? Right? Yes, never absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We've, uh, we've, we've gone through that. And I think every builder goes through that and coaches understand how to coach them through that. The pivot usually happens if, you are not seeing growth in your customer base. So even though there might be some loyal customers, the number of those customers is not enough for you to sustain that venture on them. And so that's when that pivot happens. Also in the process of building, these results, these experiments and the outcomes might take you in different directions. So the builder may have originally imagined that this is the product or service I want to bring to the to the customer. Here is what the customer really needs. And then that builder might start realizing that the general goal is, is what I started with. Uh, however, as I moved through the experiment in, experimentation stage, and the results of those experiments have made me alter my plans. And uh, with each experiment or iteration, the builder is going to get closer to building a product or service that is actually something that the customer wants. Um, and that it's called finding that, I'm sure you all know, uh, finding the product market fit. And that finding that product market fit is the key stage at which you start saying, 
this now is going to be sustainable business because until you find that product market fit, there is no sustainability in the venture. You all know the story that if <clears throat> if we had if Henry Ford had done market research, people would have said, "I want a faster horse." And so there are times when you need to build something the market might not know they need or want. Steve Jobs is another good example. But all to your very good points, at some point the customers have to validate its value from a, a, a financial perspective or uh, not. Yeah. I actually Absolutely. am not a fan of the word pivot. I think it got overused a couple of years ago, but um, you know, adaptations or there's probably other words. In maybe, Nebraska, maybe we think of pivots as, as the things that feed that water the corn, <laughs> big circle things out in the country. That's a yeah. pivot. Yeah. Well, yeah, other questions. This is a great conversation. There, there is a question in the chat room. I'm not sure how to handle it. So Todd, I'll throw it to you. Uh, it says, um, and it's a long one, so bear with me here on this one. Is this is this based on? Up. Is this uh, yeah? Is this based on Eric and is it is it to rise or is lean startup book or Steve Blank, the, the startup owner's manual or using Alexander um, Osterwalder's Oster business model generation and value proposition design? Mm -hmm. So all all three are um, people who have provided a lot of content in this area. Uh, the experiment, the hypothesize experiment get feedback, learn from your experiments is definitely a lean in strategy um, that has to be used to validate your hypotheses and to figure out if what you're building is right. Uh, Steve Blank uses that to teach his classes at Stanford and, and other schools. So yes, these are um, concepts that are being used currently to um, to validate the ideas and to activate on these ideas. This is the process. And if you use this process, um, the likelihood of success is higher and uh, you reduce the chances of failure. We bring, of course, the talent perspective to the methodology that I think is more unique than some of the traditional business 101 thinking, which are all great. But of course, the first the first session we had, and it was first on purpose, was who's the person and how are they going to understand themselves to to enter the process of building? Yeah, well, you, you still have to we, you still we, have to do all this. Sangeeta reads reads more books than I do, but I read a fair amount of articles and newsletters, so we try to keep current on what what the thinking is out there. Yeah, well, um, we talked about confirming the value proposition of, uh, to a customer, uh, which was a a critically important step for moving forward with the idea or building a sustainable venture. Um, if if the builder has reached that stage where the value proposition is very clear to the customer, the customer base is growing, and uh, the there is a, a wider adoption of the product or service, you know that that is um, a critical stage that the builder has, uh, or a step that the builder has crossed into a sustainable venture. If that's not the case, then you have to keep fine tuning the, the product through the same cycle that we just talked about. Hypothesize, experiment, measure your outcomes, um, and then go back into, after you learn and get your feedback, go back into hypothesizing. However, if, if that cycle is complete for the person, or the builder, then comes the next stage, which we will talk about. So if you can put, put the uh, the future thinking up on the screen, Jim, we are going to talk about dreaming big and how important that is. So when Stephanie and her husband launched this little venture on the side as as she was still and her husband was still working in, in jobs, uh, the idea started from filling a gap in the market around uh, providing uh, a formal uh, services in, in terms of an employer-employee uh, connection between home healthcare aides and home uh, 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 nanny services, et cetera, and uh, these, the people who work in, in that industry providing these services to families. But it grew to where it became a product that was widely needed in the market. There were 100,000 families that had signed up for it. And that was the time, that is the time for the builder then to dream big. So she talks about in her uh, experience and in her journey, a time when 
a light bulb went in of, you know, we need to think much broader than the initial idea of here is a neat idea and this is who the customer is and this is what we are going to provide. There was a need that had to be fulfilled and she needed to dream bigger. And so the last part of this is don't lose sight of the future. So when you are um, a builder or you are a coach to a builder, I think it is important to uh, understand that uh, on your way to building, you've got to uh, remember that it is uh, all about growth and scale. Now, we don't go too much into growth and scale, but it is important to make sure that the future is outlined in a very clear way so that the customer, the, the um, builder never loses sight of how big um, I can be with this particular product or service. So for, for Stephanie, it was time to think about expanding her customer base to become a leader in professionalizing the in-home care industry. And she talks about then growing nationally. That was not the intent when, when they started the business, but it very quickly, it became evident that there is a demand in the market. And then why not grow nationally? Why not go to that next step? Why not put processes and technology and people in place to be able to take that business to the, to the next level? Um, and she realized in her journey that uh, no one else was doing that. And so professionalizing in-home care industry, which usually works in the informal sector, uh, was a big, hairy goal that she picked up for herself and, and then made changes, made huge investments into a business that was started on a shoestring budget years yes. ago uh, into taking it to that next level and and building it up and and building that business is a completely different <laughs> ball game than starting something and getting it to a sustainable level so in this in this book and all these exercises and tools that we have come up with it is about taking it from zero to a sustainable entity a sustainable business where you have validated your business model basically so these steps were validating that business model now moving from here to the next stage we will talk about putting a team together but there is much more that needs to happen to grow and scale i think the last point we want to leave you with though is don't lose sight of the future when you are consulting with these people who are establishing their own uh, ventures uh, because it's as important as the initial things we've done up to this point. <clears throat> Being self-aware, recognizing who the person is, how does the person leverage their strengths? What can he or she build that really resonates with them? How do you recognize opportunities knowing who you are and starting from that point? Where do ideas come from? And then what do you do with those ideas? Today we talked about what to do with those ideas. Uh, how to craft assumptions, how to launch experiments, how to measure your outcomes. Decide whether you want to change direction or you want to keep refining your product. Think about the future. I think about a future where we're as systematic about finding and developing builders as we are athletes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's in my column. We're getting there. <clears throat> Uh, Sangeeta, a question from the chat room. Could you effectively use the business model canvas as part of the builder profile um, that will help owners grasp these ideas better? You can totally use uh, the canvas. You can also use the storyboard tool that we've provided you, which is much more intuitive. It answers very specific questions. It helps you validate your idea even before you put any resources in it. So we would encourage you to use that. You will find it much easier to use. But Yes, absolutely. By all means, use whatever tools help you make the point and help get clarity uh, of the process to your uh, to your client. And we didn't talk about this. The example is kind of an outward facing uh, startup kind of, you know, options. What about inside an organization? Just as valid to taking these steps through if I wanted to create a new business opportunity inside an organization, same steps? Same steps. We just talked about what we did with BP10. I think uh, yeah. Todd keeps talking about a lot of experiments that we have run over the years. I think it's exactly the same process. You 
constantly have to look for opportunities. Um, you have to test those ideas. You've got to activate on those ideas. You have to learn from what your customers are telling you. And you have to build your product or service over time um, and keep doing it on a shoestring budget and very low resources. <laughs> I, I feel a speech coming on. I'm not going to do that to our, to our listeners. And Roy can edit it out anyway. But um, <clears throat> we as a country, we as business leaders, talk about innovation all day long. And, and then we put a box for ideas at the front door. It's horrific how antiquated our true innovation uh, uh, infrastructure is because no process or intentionality. Uh, you know what? There's a feeling of that we don't do that here, which is actually a lesson for in my world. But, but it can become, you know, uh, uh, dangerous to be an innovator or a disruptor within an existing business. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of opportunity. And as I say on each one of these calls, companies that aren't doing this with, with a serious intentionality uh, won't be with us longer. Uh, one of the seminal pieces, uh, new growth platforms, is a Harvard Business Review article that really changed my life probably 12, 13 years ago. So if people want to Google out and find new growth platforms, it talks about corporate America's need for a structured, by definition, new growth platforms uh, in the title. Uh, and I think we've got a long way to go. I could sit here in the sun and go down by listing companies that didn't uh, have a talent-based approach to a uh, new product, service, or geography. Well, and Todd, that's really the key is this, is at the beginning, we're identifying those talents up front as opposed to just gathering a bunch of guys from college and saying, hey, let's, it, you know, let's start this thing up. Uh, and, and that can work, <laughs> Setting that framework in advance of knowing the people and knowing their gifts and talents, knowing what they can and can't do, and then putting that frame to that framework together in advance yeah. before we start marching off. You, you know the players, you know, you know your army, you know your, you know, you know what your soldiers can do. And yes. I think that's oftentimes it's a missing step in this when we send folks out to do things like this, whether it's internal and external. And we haven't taken a good grasp of Hey, what's the inventory of our players? Yep. Like it's the yeah. sports analogy is perfect, but we're great Monday morning quarterbacks and we can look back and say, but of course, and we can all go through our litany of examples. But what if we were to get up around Wednesday or Thursday, maybe before the market does what the market will do before business does what business will do uh, in a, in a free, free market economy. <clears throat> so yeah, that's, that's our analogy is, <clears throat> Everybody's a great Monday morning quarterback after they've seen the game and know the score. But what if we can get up around? I'm on the Missouri River. So what if we can get up around the bend? That's a whole lot of what we're working on here with this talent development. Activity. I think this is this is also uh, missing from most other uh, launch advice or business advice. Uh, this is a variable that very few take into consideration, even though this explains um, additional variance in the outcome we are all interested in, which is sustainable and high growing businesses. Uh, so putting these together and next time what we will talk about is that next step of growth. Uh, and you start by building a, the right team around you and a great team um, can really critically accelerate the growth phase. So uh, that again, will take us back to that understanding and self-awareness and knowing yourself and knowing your team members and how to put these, uh, these teams together that have the collective talent to drive that, that business ahead. Now think about the venture capital industry. We'll throw a hundred darts at the map, at the wall, and we'll hope one of them pays for the other 99 investments. I mean, we've got a lot of good friends in that industry, but I think most would agree that that has been a big part of the history was deal flow, volume, and hope you got <clears throat> Facebook or Twitter in there somewhere. We can do better than that. Yeah. Uh, Todd, we have some, as we wrap this up, we have some training associated with this, and I know some of it's coming up around the summit. Can you talk to that real quick? Yeah, we've got, I think they're going to fill up. Uh, there's some great people that are signing up from all over the world. They're always fun uh, courses around the summit, the two days before and the two days after. And I don't have the exact dates, but it's pretty easy to find all over the courses. And Cl CliftonStrengthSummit.com will actually yeah. have all that information. Coaching Builder Talents. Uh, they're, again, super engaging sessions. I would also put a plug into the new website. If folks haven't been up there, we have added the new persona 
the user videos are kind of fun. Of course, our national change the dialogue videos there as well. And every one of these activities is on the dashboard. So you have to have purchased at least the, the, the assessment to get access <clears throat> into all these writable PDFs. Highly encourage folks to experiment with them. And, and quite honestly, some might be better for some companies or students than others at a given time or in a given context. That's fine. We put them all up there. Uh, in, in module form so that uh, they can be used and individualized. And any special deals if you're coming to the summit on our on our training? I believe there's a discount. There's a 15% discount. Wow. That's I that cool. I never approved of that. <laughs> I think we should have get that price up, but I'm biased. There we go. So head out to uh, cliftonstrengthsummit.com. You can see there's a tab up there that says courses available during the summit. 15% Discount if you're coming either before or after. The summit's the 16th, 17th, and 18th of July. And so we'd love to have you. That's 2018. If you're listening to this after that, head out to our courses page, courses.gallup.com. We'll have all, everything that uh, we have current. And we, Todd, I do get that question a lot. Uh, do we have any plans for anything else uh, at post-summit? We do. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we aim at the summit real hard. But I, I have every expectation of another Omaha course and probably a Washington, D.C. course yet this year quarter three, quarter four, but, you know, we're trying to encourage folks into the summit, uh, but there will be best time to sort of, best time to do it. Weekend we're in this for a hundred years, the week after. So Sangeet, anything you, else you would add before we close it? Keep building, keep building, build on. <laughs> I used right. to say game on, and now I say build on. It's how I sign my emails as well. And thank you to all those coaches who are starting to put their BP10 results uh, on their signature lines. It's it's increasing and it's pretty awesome. Uh, the conversation is definitely underway. Very good. We'll remind everyone to take full advantages of all the resources we have available. Todd mentioned this earlier. Head out to the new BP10 site, gallup.com forward slash builder. We'll get you there. And I uh, would love to have us send us your, qu your questions or comments. You can send those to us in an email, coaching at gallup.com. You can catch the recorded audio and video of this program as well as the past ones, actually in two locations, uh, coaching.gallup.com uh, for all of our coaching work, plus the new BP10 site that I mentioned out there. We have been posting these videos out there. By the time you listen to it, they may all be out there. And so head out to see all part, part one, two, three, and four of this series that we have put together all posted on the on that page we mentioned it before but if you're coming to the clifton strength summit just go to cliftonstrengthsummit.com still time to get your uh, registration in if you're going to join us for 2018 if it's not 2018 which is very very possible i'm sure we'll have another summit out there available for you cliftonstrengthsummit.com if you want to join the conversation we have a bp10 group on our in on facebook go to facebook.com slash group slash bp10 we'll get you there love to continue that conversation of dedicated coaches that are out there talking about it and uh, we look forward to the next call to coach we have one more of these and if you want to get signed up for it Head out to a, to gallup.com. I'm sorry. Let's try that again. Gallup.eventbrite.com. I've been doing this all day, so appreciate your patience with me. Um, you can head out there and get registered for this and uh, join us live. Ask your questions live. We'll be back next week with the last of four. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.